Good evening, everyone. I have decided that I'm going to do four mini lectures. I'm going to try to make the last three be truly mini lectures. We'll see if I can get them done in under five minutes each. This one might take a little bit longer because it's got some more detailed stuff. But the good thing about a mini lecture is I can explain it kind of quickly and then you can go back over it again. So I'll try to do it that way. This is actually a very interesting topic because we're going to talk about what experiments can you do when you take mitochondria and you put them in a tube. Because you have both the electron transfer chain and you also have ATP synthase. So you can mess with the pH, you can mess with the protons, you can mess with the, um, the electrons, you can do all sorts of things and figure out how mitochondria work. This actually is really important stuff because it has to do with the basic way that mitochondria, the role they fulfill in how life works. It also has to do with the job you can get because it involves pharmacokinetics. And I'll explain what that is as we go through. So we left off with this experiment in the lecture. Basically what this is, is that because you can measure oxygen consumption, which measures electron transport chain activity, you can measure ATP synthesis, which measures ATP synthase activity, and those usually go together. In this case, they're going together. You're, you don't get them going at all until you have a place to put the electron energy, ADP, and a place to give you electrons, succinate. When both of those are present, it starts going. And then you interfere with one part of the system. Usually the whole thing shuts down. Cyanide messes with the, ent the entire cyanide messes with the cytochrome oxidase, so it stops electron transfer. But of course, there's no more ATP synthesis either. either. It's important to say in intact mitochondria, usually the two are coupled. Then we talked it, we end up with this idea where there's a time when the two of them are uncoupled. This is the exact same experiment. Sustenate and ADP are added in a different order, but it doesn't matter. You need both to start, no matter which order they're added in. And then we in inhibit with oligomycin, we inhibit the synthase. And the synthase both stop because they're both connected. The protons build up for maybe a little while. Maybe there's a little upward slope there in the oxygen consumption. But they don't have anywhere to go. So after a while, the electrons get backed up because ATP synthase can't turn and can't let them back in. And there's only so many electrons you can pump out. It gets harder and harder, and eventually you just can't do it pretty quickly. But the weird thing about DNP is when you add it, in this situation where it's blocked, you add DNP, and DNP acts like ATP synthase in that it can bring protons across the membrane, but you don't get any good from it. You don't get any ATP synthesized, but Instead, you just have oxygen consumption without getting any ATP for it. DNP sort of short circuits the whole thing. So realize that the normal situation is shown on the left, and on the right you have the uncoupled situation. Normal situation is coupled. Uncoupling is weird. But it's not really weird because it lets us know how things work. And DNP must be a special kind of chemical. And it turns out that the simplest form of uncoupling, I mentioned some of this. Um, you might want to pause and think back to what I said if you want help filling in the blanks. But the simplest form of uncoupling is breaking the inner membrane apart. If you just add something that pokes holes in the membrane of the mitochondria, those holes will let the protons flow through and they won't go through ATP synthase because why go through this little turnstile when somebody has the big door open to the side? Everyone does that, right? You know, they don't go through the turnstile if you don't have to. And that's what the protons do. So the simplest form of uncoupling is an unintact membrane where you have uh, a place to put the protons, but you don't have any proton gradient really being built up. But DNP is different. It's a chemical. The electron membrane, uh, the mitochondrial membrane, is still intact, but it's effectively chemically broken apart because the protons are able to hop over the membrane. They hop over the turnstile, in a sense. So the common characteristic of uncouplers is that they are both hydrophobic and proton accepting. The good news is that's hard to do. So you don't have very many uncouplers. So here's what DNP is. It's just 2,4-dinitrophenol. You could actually figure out that structure if you knew the organic no nomenclature well enough. And it turns out that that is hydrophobic enough to, um, and when it binds a proton, it's more hydrophobic. So it's able to cross the membrane and then let off the proton in the place where it's more energetically stable. 
This FCCP is another example. Notice how it kind of looks like DNP and it has the same kind of charge pattern. When it's deprotonated, it's charged. When it's protonated, it's uncharged. And that helps it be more hydrophobic. Both of these are bad news because they are toxic in a certain degree. If they can get to your mitochondria in a high enough concentration, they can effectively poke holes in the membrane, not literally, but chemically. So these will accept the proton on the positive side. They'll diffuse across the membrane and they're uncharged or, you know, they're just polar, but they're apparently uncharged enough to dissolve in the membrane. Then they release the proton on the inside. So these will disrupt the gradient. And remember that we had a, a thing when we talked about um, we talked about ion gradients across the membrane, sodium, potassium. There were things called ionophores. And all these did is they bound ions. And in their ionic form, they would be relatively nonpolar. So they would bind ions on one side of the membrane, go down the concentration gradient, and just naturally let them go when they've crossed the membrane. They basically poke holes in the fence. And uh, it's exactly the same thing. And the cool thing is that you can actually use ionophores and uh, these uncouplers together. And this is a little bit complicated, but I want you to trace through this. What you do is you, uh, this is actually an important experiment, but it was relatively easy to do once I got the idea. It proved that a proton gradient drives ATP synthesis. And all you did is you separate out active mitochondria, intact mitochondria, and you soaked them in a uh, pH, uh, pH 7 solution, uh, well, yeah, pH 9 solution. I'm sorry, you start them in a pH 9 solution. I, I should uh, look at my actual slide to let you know what's actually going on. So there's two things about the solution. It is pH 9, and it's got a lot of potassium in it. And the, you put the mitochondria in there long enough for them to equilibrate so that they are pH 9 inside and outside. They aren't terribly happy, but they're still alive. They, well, if you can consider them to be alive. They're still as alive as they'll ever be. They're still functional. We'll say it that way. So then you take these potassium-rich pH 9 mitochondria and you transfer them to the pH 7 buffer. Now, in the first moments after you transfer them, the pH 7 buffer is easily gets all the way to the inner membrane, but it doesn't pass into the inner membrane yet. So you have high potassium, low or high potassium, high pH, alkaline pH mitochondria on the inside, and they're in a normal solution on the outside. There's no KCl on the outside, and there's pH 7 buffer. Now remember, because the inner membrane is impermeable to these, it's not equilibrating very quickly at all. So the outside and inside have a gradient in both protons and in potassiums. So uh, in this case, what you do is you add an ionophore because the ionophore will carry the potassium down its gradient and it will actually create a charge imbalance that results in the inside being more negative in charge because it will carry the, uh, it'll carry the potassium and yes, th this is exactly what you see. I wanted to make sure that I'm explaining it right. Uh, the Right. Yeah, I just want to make sure, and I should probably let you pause and look at this because this is exactly what it's saying. The concentration of potassium is, um, is actually kept lower than the concentration outside. Is that right? I am misinterpreting the bottom. So you see that here's what the problem is. But because I want to do this real fast, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm explaining everything right and I'm then confusing myself. So maybe you want to fast forward. But uh, the whole thing is you add the ionophore. The ionophore is able to go back and forth and is ba basically able to carry the potassium from the inside to the outside. Because there's no potassium outside, the potassium gets drained outside. That means that positive charge is being moved from the inside of the, uh, the um, mitochondria to the outside, even though the protons are still at pH 9. So you have this, this case where the, a positive charge is being built up by the ionophore. It shows it right down there on the bottom. So I should probably go by the, um, by the picture rather than by my explanation. But when this happens, you actually have the proper charge being set up and the charge imbalance is the normal charge imbalance. It's just that you have 
the proton imbalance where you have more protons on the outside and then you have set up the right electrochemical gradient the right imbalance of charge and protons without pumping any electrons at all none of these electrons have been pumped they've just been soaked into this situation but once you have the imbalance it doesn't matter that the electron transport chain is unfunctional it doesn't matter that you haven't added electrons as long as you have the proper charge and the proper number of protons on the outside the protons will move down their gradient into the inside and the way that you set up the charge imbalance is with the ionophore see this is complicated and i'm trying to explain it probably a little too quickly but sit here and read it and go through this this is all correct and especially the uh, picture itself is correct this might take some looking at the book and this is as complicated as it gets but this is sort of the capstone experiment for this chapter this is a way that you can run the atp without any source of electrons there's oxygen there but there's no electrons being passed to oxygen you go running it basically like a zombie ATP synthase because what you've done is you've just set up the proper kind of charge gradient the proper pH gradient and that will run the synthase um, by itself this is a really cool experiment but it's kind of complicated to see what the ionophore is doing focus on that and because the ionophore short circuits this important part of respiration it means that you will be burning energy you'll be taking electrons and basically burning them to oxygen without getting anything back for it that means you won't be making enough ATP and your body will be trying to make ATP in other ways it'll be trying to metabolize fats you know it'll be turning to these other things that's why DNP is actually a weight loss chemical the ionophore so uh, and by the way it's an ionophore for the ion that is a proton so it's a protonophore or an ionophore for protons it causes weight loss and if you think about that it's actually a treatment for diseases that have obesity components and so I want you to let you think about which diseases are the most prevalent that would be like this I'll give you a second to think about it then I'll show you what my fill in the blank is because this is from this paper liver disease is actually uh, an important part of uh, it's involved with obesity type 2 diabetes insulin resistance is like that and then there is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis which is a specific form of liver disease that we're talking about and that's the model that they had in rats so they actually gave DNP to rats and if you do that they will get thinner the problem is the DNP as you can see it messes with all your mitochondria so your entire body's energetic balance gets messed up so it's too toxic for humans to use they actually used it as a diet drug in the 1930s until people showed very ill of side effects and eventually they figured out oh this isn't worth it you know this is killing people it's not really making them lose weight um, but the researchers here they actually pharmacologically manipulated DNP what this means is that they enclosed it in a special chemical a polymer bead that had different layers kind of like a jawbreaker candy and it would dissolve over time like a jawbreaker candy and each layer would slowly release the DNP so you weren't hitting the body with this big dose of DNP all at once it turns out that this low dose of DNP actually worked in the rats and they showed much fewer side effects so it's possible that DNP could be brought back from its uh, purgatory where it's not allowed to be used because it's too toxic if we can figure out how to have a controlled dosage kind of thing the controlled dosage is chemistry of things dissolving the kinetics of how drugs work like this is called pharmacokinetics and it's a whole field you can actually get a PhD in pharmacokinetics and definitely you can get a job because pharmacy companies pharmaceutical biotech they're very interested in how fast the kinetics of how things work by the way physical chemistry concerns kinetics so if you want to learn more about pharmacokinetics, I suggest taking a physical chemistry class, such as the one I'm teaching in the spring. Talk to me more if you want to know about that. One last experimental detail. We've been going through and talking about how many ATP do you get from one pair of electrons, from one NADH. And you know the number, 2.5. And that comes about because 2.5 um, ATP are made by 10 protons being pumped across, divided by three ATP per proton uh, 
and then you have the fourth ATP that, uh, the, that I'm saying this backwards, three protons per ATP. Then you have a fourth proton. So you really have four protons per ATP. Remember, you've got to get that phosphate across. Okay, so the thing is 10 divided by four, 10 protons pumped divided by four protons needed to make an ATP equals 2.5. FAD only uh, pumps across six. So sustenate, for example, will only pump across six. Six divided by four is 1.5. So that number we've been saying all along is totally dependent on how many protons can you get pumped across for a particular pair of electrons that you start with. This is called the P to O ratio because it's about the number of ATPs, the number of Ps that are put onto ADP per O uh, atom that is reduced. Now this is weird, but it's each pair of electrons. Remember, it takes a pair of electrons to turn one half of an O2 molecule into H2O. And because a pair of electrons is what's usually given to the ele electron transport chain, it is the most logical unit for us to be using. It's how many ATP is an NADH electron pair worth. So it's called the P to O ratio. It's kind of a weird term, but if you think about it, it makes sense. And originally it was thought this had to be an integer because before Peter Mitchell came along, everyone thought that there had to be some kind of connection, just like there's a connection between the electrons going all the way to oxygen. They thought there had to be a connection, a direct connection between the pair of electrons and the ATP because everything else works like that, but not ATP synthase. Because ATP synthase works off of protons, which you pump across multiple protons per electron pair, it's actually the protons that matter. And those are the things that have to be an integer. So it can be a non-integer of electron pairs as long as it's still an integer of protons. And that's the, that's the thing. So that's why it, it was actually tricky to figure out. And before they figured out that they, these were connected through the proton gradient, people would assume that it had to be a whole number, not 2.5. But all their information gave us, gave them 2.5, 2.6, 2.4, right? And so they were like, oh, well, it must be rounding up. We know it has to be an integer, so it must be rounding up to three. And in fact, they, will, they would assume the same thing for the sustenate type electrons. They would round those up to two. It's very reasonable, actually. It's just that the theory was wrong. The actual results were right because they were converging on 2.5. And realize that this comes from 10 divided by 4 equals 2.5. And for the FADs, 6 divided by 4 equals 1.5. It's the same for sustenate. It was originally rounded up to 2, but it's actually 1.5. And so that is why you should always listen to the more up-to-date and why scientists... I like it when scientists get it wrong because I get enough wrong things that I want to know that other people can do it too.